All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I think people will still be coming in the room, uh, but good morning, good morning. Uh, it, it's very nice to, to see you all here this morning. I'm sorry that we can't be in person and getting to interact with the audience, uh, but we, we're gonna have the uh, really uh, invigorating discussion. And just to remind everyone, the chat function is on and enabled, and you'll be able to submit questions through the Q&A and no need to wait uh, to the end for the end of the program. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end, but happy to take the questions uh, uh, whenever we can in the program. So I am, my name is Catherine Mirkar. I'm the co-chair of the International Dispute Resolution Group at Doe Boys and Clinton. It's my distinct privilege and pleasure to moderate today and to welcome you to the program. So over the past decade, small satellite technology and with it, the pace of launches, the number of participating launch states has grown at a rapid. Small sats are the focus of both public and private investment and also hopes for equitable development. This technology can be used to support scientific research in space and to advance commercial and humanitarian ends on Earth. There's clear telecommunication utilities and Earth observation capacity can be leveraged to enhance things like mapping, tracking weather, improving ag agriculture, and mitigating natural disasters. Small sets also expand the capability of private actors to engage in space activities as they lower launch and deployment costs. So as more actors launch small satellites into orbit, there's some pressure on devising an international legal regime that strives to enhance the benefits and meet the challenges of this proliferation. With most small sats launched only into the limited field of low Earth orbit, the problems of overcrowding, debris, safety, traffic control, risk management, and access arise just in the few. That gets us to the topic of today's discussion, small satellites, big possibilities, how to build a fair legal regime for developing technology. Although some might um, argue with developing, but we can get into that in a bit. To help us grapple with these questions is a truly remarkable array of experts. We have with us today, Sasha Field, the General Counsel of Spaceflight, a launch services and mission management company based in Seattle, Washington. She has an astrophysics degree from Harvard and has been immersed in the industry for 20 plus years. We have with us Dr. Yoongjin Jung, a distinguished senior researcher at the Republic of Korea Space Agency, brings a wealth of experience from the state perspective. And finally, last but not least, Professor Franz von der Dunk is a professor of space law at the Nebraska College of Law and has advised many governments on an array of issues related to space activities, such as space policy, international cooperation in space, national space law, and privatization of space activities. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking a Saturday to be with us. We really appreciate it. So I want to start with the table setting. We have to, I've obviously talked a little bit about the legal landscape, but Franz, if I could start with you, could you just set the table for us on um, how you would describe the current state of the legal framework? What are the relevant major instruments and norms that we should talk about in terms of this discussion? Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me to this August panel. Um, and uh, it's interesting to, to realize that the state of the legal framework today uh, essentially has not changed that much, uh, even though the issue of small satellites, as you indicated, was a very new one. But the main treaties date back to the 60s and 70s. I'm going to go in slightly greater detail in a minute. Um, and even though in a number of respects, which we will also, I'm sure, discuss, they are no longer fully able to address the topic of small satellites, they still provide us with the major legal framework. The most important treaty is, is clearly the Outer Space Treaty, which uh, was concluded in 1967, 10 years after Sputnik, which was basically the first human act activity in outer space, even if by proxy. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty uh, is, is the short name. It has a much longer name, which I won't spell out here right now. Uh, the most important thing to take home, apart from the fact that it does include all the major legal principles applicable to space activities, so including even if not thought about at the time, small satellites. Apart from that is that it's ratified by all states who, who are active in space. So the United States, Russia, China, major European countries, Japan, but also the major developing countries, um, uh, Brazil, Nigeria, Indonesia, India, they're all party to this. And, and, and that includes also 
uh, ambitious newcomers as if you allow me to say so as such as South Korea. So it is a globally applicable legal framework and there's little discussion uh, about uh, countries activities perhaps not being covered in principle by the outer space treaty. Now the nickname of the outer space treaty is, is the principles treaty which is also part of that full title and that already indicates that there was a need to elaborate on certain parts of the outer space treaty in greater detail. So we saw in the next few years following 1967, uh, in particular three further treaties arising, the rescue and return agreement, which speaks about the rescue of astronauts, but also about the return of space objects. And that is obviously more important for the small satellite issue because small satellites do not carry astronauts. Uh, a second uh, important treaty was the Liability Convention of 1972, which actually elaborated the single article in the Outer Space Treaty, which already addressed the principle as such. And for example, provides for uh, absolute liability for damage caused on Earth versus fault liability for damage caused in outer space. And it also very importantly calls for uh, an in principle unlimited liability. So there's no cap on the liability per se. And the last of the three follow-up conventions that is worth mentioning here is the Registration Convention. Again, a short name for a treaty which uh, has a slightly longer name. As it indicates, it talks about the registration of space objects, more specifically about space objects being launched into outer space um, for the purpose of identification. Uh, but also for the purposes of allowing the state using that satellite, or I should actually say registering that satellite, to exercise some form of jurisdiction and control over that satellite, even when it's out there. Um, because it became increasingly difficult in the, in the following years, from the 1970s onwards, late 1970s onwards, to conclude treaties which could carry the majority of the spacefaring countries, the United Nations, which was used as a platform for drafting these treaties, became a little bit less ambitious. And we've seen a number of UN resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, being adopted, which, of course, as such, are not legally binding, but can very well provide a starting point for development towards customary international law. And there are such discussions as dealing with um, remote send or such principles as dealing with remote sensing, which fall in that category. There have been uh, resolutions developing um, the concept of benefits for all countries and how does that work. The most important one I dare say actually, or it's perhaps it's two. One and is dealing with the uh, with, uh, uh, legal issue of space debris and space debris mitigation, which is one element which nobody thought about back in 1967. So there's only one very generic and, and broad and actually somewhat vague article which indirectly addresses this in the 1967 treaty, Article 9. Uh, but now we do see a, uh, a growing concern, obviously, of many states with the issue of space debris. We see that reflected in a resolution of the Committee on Outer Space, on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space of the UN, which is dealing with these issues, which tries to, again, present guidelines for states and any private operators to operate in a relatively safe manner in outer space so as to minimize the creation of new space debris. Um, that is one important recent development and other important recent development also uh, reflected by a UN General Assembly resolution is the, uh, the resolution on space legislation or national legislation and that brings me to the final part of my introductory words. Um, the international treaties back in the 60s and early 70s basically addressed states. The word private sector is not at all in there the word non-governmental non entity only once, and it uh, immediately makes clear that states are responsible and liable for what their private sector entities do in outer space, which then gives rise, of course, to the phenomenon of national space law, because by that token, a state can control the private sector activities for which, for which it, as a state, will be directly the responsible and liable on the international plane. So as of today, we've seen uh, close to uh, two and a half dozen states across the world, 
including the United States, but also states, small states, which may come as a surprise to you, states like Luxembourg or the United Arab Emirates and, and South Korea is, is, is somewhere in the middle of that range, I dare say. They have all agreed to adopt national space laws, which basically provide for a system of authorization of the private sector to go into outer space. And of course, by that token also provides for some level of control. In view of the time, I want to stop there, but we can obviously go into many of these issues in greater detail. Thank you so much. That's beautifully put in terms of the table setting to get us started. Um, so as you say, uh, it's been these, these, these legal principles uh, and underlying treaties have been in place for quite a bit of time. You also remind us that there are a few the issues that are, say, emerging issues, which is both the space debris and the private sector involvement have been less of a focus on, on the, the pre-existing legal regimes. And so as you know, there has been some you know, observations coming out of the satellite industry in particular, that this is outdated, this is fragmented, that there are gaps in governance. So Sasha, I wanna to turn to you uh, for that perspective. Do you agree with those observations about fragmentation and, and gaps? And how do private actors experience these gaps if they, if they exist in the international legal framework? I'm sorry. Technology. Sasha. There we go. We got you. <laughs> got it. All right. Tell me if it doesn't stay loud enough. The problem with any technology is the gap between development of technology and keeping pace uh, based on the laws. Law making is inherently slower, and it, as it should be, it, it needs more consideration. The advancement of the satellite industry, for reasons that I think you've put out very nicely, but advance, based on advancement of technology primarily, and an increase in willingness to fund, means that players in the private sector are moving faster and faster, and that widens the gap with both state and international. So the gaps are everywhere and there, there's nothing um, inherently wrong with that. It's the dynamic tension. It requires, however, that um, in state in particular, uh, regulators and to a certain extent the international really need to understand where the regulatory bodies, or, I'm sorry, where the private sector has gotten to or is getting to what is the bleeding edge what are we going to need to not just what do we need to regulate now but what are we going to need to regulate in a few years because if you don't start now you won't be there by the time the industry is getting there and then you have problems and and that leads to perhaps examples are a potential explosion in debris which could have catastrophic effects um, without management of it or conflicts over the use of frequencies and how you balance those out. So the, the experience of the private sector is always, almost always a struggle of the long pole in the tent is the regulatory element. And how do you build a company that can succeed, especially early stage, with the investment needed, the high level of investment, and the ability to meet the needs of the investors while tracking to the regulatory. So that, that I would say is the fundamental com complication that the private sector faces. We'll get into a little bit more detail into some of those, those complications in a moment. But Dr. John, if I could turn to you for the state perspective, you know, given that obviously we have private commercial space industry, it's relatively new uh, in terms of the entrance into the field. How do you think about balancing making decisions or advocating for policies that support current work from the state perspective against the need to ensure the industry overall is viable and sustainable in several decades from now? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's my pleasure to uh, talk about news as is legal issues with a great expert. And um, so I with respect to that, your question, so let me take an example in South Korea. A company will launch in next year a small satellite for commercial use, such as disaster management, agriculture, and so on. 
this is one satellite is is the 20 centimeter wide 10 centimeter long and the sub centimeter high and it weighed about 11 kilogram this company planned to launch more than 50 small satellites at altitude 500 kilometer in the long run for a constellation however even though we have a national space registration, but there is no any provision to be applied to small satellite activities. There is one more similar case. A Korean venture company is relaunch a bird, a sub of the space launch vehicle in the near future. And so this company requested a permission from the Korean government for its launching. We have some provisions concerning permission of launching, launching space launch vehicle in, in national space registration. However, it is not clear that the space launch vehicle include a sub of the launch vehicles. Uh, the reason is that there's no definition on space launch vehicle and outer space in the national space registration. In this regard, the, the current government has been facing several regulatory challenges with respect to small satellite launch and operations, including sub of the launch vehicle, to be carried out by the private entities. As several regulatory challenges have long been addressed by the industry, of course, in South Korea. I'd like to highlight some of the challenges. The first Ambiguous regulatory frameworks make it difficult for operators to identify if and to what extent the regulations apply to them. There is a particular ambiguity around what types of satellites are considered small and under what parameters. The secondary management of space debris is becoming more important as the number of objects in outer space increases. Obligation to notify satellite network with ITU is on also an issue, especially for small and medium sized companies. And I add the lack of harmonized approach to licensing and the frequency authorizations from national authorities. And the finally, type approval of end UJ equipment due to variety of requirements in different jurisdictions. For this, the current government is looking for now some ways to overcome those challenges on the basis of international space norms, including a technical and or legal standard. In that connection, the attitude of Korean space stakeholders, in particular in industrial sector, is somewhat negative because they consider that the way to regulate a small satellite is likely to be strict. But the, the current government continues to persuade stakeholders. And at the same time, the government has been making effort to look for a Korean small and medium companies with the capability to meet international technical standards. And then finally, there are already some competitive companies that will be able to manufacture components and the parts of space objects, including satellite. And so the current government is somewhat confident that national regulatory framework need to be strict. There's, there's, a two region, there's a two region for this decision. The first region is that the state share bear international responsibility for national activities. As you know, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities. The second is that some of severe technical regulatory standards need to be required to emerging stakeholders in order that they be competitive in the global market in the near future. As an example, the current government adopted in 2020 a recommendation on space service mitigations that applies to all national stakeholders, not only but not only public institutes, but also universities, private companies. According to these recommendations, we abide by 25 years of lifetime of space service. 
and now Korean national stakeholders are in line with the government policies. Because I, I, I am the legal advisor for the current government concerning our space activities, and and this is why I am the, inside the, the all negotiations for this uh, guide, this recommendation. This is what I can say now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that actually is a, a perfect uh, um, capsulation of some of the definitional yeah. challenges and some of the regulatory challenges. So, so let's talk about some of the responses to, to these challenges. Um, as lawyers, we like rules. That's what we are, we are just uh, raised in, is when there's insufficiency, we tend to promulgate rules. And here in this context, um, I suppose, we, we should speak to some of the very important UN uh, bodies in particular that are trying to come in and deal with the emerging tech, the emerging issues. So you've already mentioned, Vrance, the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. There's also the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, both of which have promulgated guidelines, guidelines, and that's key, for traffic management and debris removal. Franz, I just wanted to turn to you and talk, ask a very basic question, but do you think this kind of, and I'll call it international rulemaking, um, but you could call it soft norms, guidelines, however we want to put it, is that an appropriate tool for, for regulating uh, these kinds of activities? And it's obviously assuming, if you will, an absence of states to agree to new sets of you know, treaties, either through multilateral or bilateral instruments. But is this exercise no. appropriate in your view? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and again, premised by your last point, obviously, as, as lawyers, we would prefer to see black letter law treaties, because then we are very clear, or at least relatively very clear on what the obligations and rights are. But given also what, what uh, Sasha said about uh, uh, the, the, the law following the technical developments and the, the quickness with which these technical developments take place, it is important for states to be given some, some learning curve. So the, the, the perfect way of these IADC guidelines, which then sort of were summarized in a short version in the COPOS guidelines on the same issue as, as to me the most interesting example, frankly speaking, um, allows states to, to start working with them, see to what extent they are really appropriate, applicable, make sense, or in some cases perhaps lead to unexpected or even perverse results. And then by doing so, you gradually learn the ropes of, of what the problem of space debris really is and how you can perhaps to some extent legally try to manage it. And uh, what you see in the space debris field in particular, and I think that's actually um, gives hope that this may lead to hard letter law sooner or later, even if not on an international level yet, is that you see increasingly states using those informal guidelines, this non binding as such non legally binding guidelines, as part of the licensing process of which I recently spoke, and also Dr. Jung mentioned briefly Article 6, uh, uh, the authorization of non-governmental entities. So you see major spacefaring countries requiring of their uh, prospective licensees uh, plans which directly refer to the guidelines. Uh, what are you going to do with your satellite at your end of lifetime? What measures have you taken uh, to prevent it from breaking up on launch? And if the answers to those questions are not satisfactory to the licensing authority, the operator doesn't get the license. So obviously for the licensee, it thereby already becomes hard letter law, black letter law. Right. Um, so that's, that, that's why I think it is certainly in the absence of, of a real international treaty, because I think we all agree that geopolitically that is not likely to happen, uh, that this is certainly an appropriate solution. Thank you. Dr. John, do you agree? I have to say, um, obviously states get sensitive about uh, norms that uh, they did not consent to through official means that ne nevertheless um, bind either through custom or guidelines that harden. But what do you think about this international rulemaking process as an enterprise? Is it useful uh, from a state perspective? Uh, yes, it is quite useful for, in particular, emerging countries. 
So in that connection, I would like to mention some important things in the rulemaking process. Uh, so my experience is uh, based on the lesson learned from, from the process of negotiations of the draft International Code of Conduct for Outer Space Activities uh, led by the European Union and uh, Western countries. So as, as all of you know, uh, unhappiness is uh, we did not reach an agreement on the, this uh, draft Code of Conduct. But the, the main problem with the draft Code of Conduct was, was the following. Is the process of negotiation transparent? And where we should uh, discuss this kind of legal instrument? How many nations uh, participate in these negotiations? And also, do non governmental stakeholders know this draft code of conduct that is under negotiations? And also, at the time, so I, at the time, so I participate in all negotiations of this uh, draft code of conduct as a member of current delegation to the multilateral meetings. And the, the Korean officer also asked me so, this kind of the questions. If it is difficult to come to an agreement on internationally legally binding instrument, and so if it is essential to adopt guidelines, we must discuss them inside the United Nations, including corpus. And for this, we need to increase the number of membership of the corpus because there are already so, or about the 100 countries, space fairy nations. And also the state encourages their national entities to have knowledge of space-related international norms and to educate them and also to make them participating in the process of negotiations at international level. The private industrial sector need to be aware of the obligation to respect the international norms in doing small, in doing small satellite activities. So in reality, so many, in particular, small and medium-sized companies, they do not know so why we should respect the international norm, because the outer space is an area to have a free access. Or at least they, they told me that I don't understand. Uh, that is one of the most important things, I think. I'm sure that the, this way the rulemaking process will be able to fill the governance gap. I, and also I think, and it will not take long for it. Take just one example. So, uh, the, the UN Capital adopted the last year, the, the, the guideline, the 2021 20, guidance for, for long-term sustainability for outer space activities. So the Korean government agreed on, on with that guideline, this is this is why the current the, the Korean government is preparing a national the committee to educate a small and medium company and also a professor professor from the universities why we this must respect these guidelines. And uh, we have a meeting, we have meetings a month to educate, to persuade them. But it, it's quite difficult. I don't, I don't know if it will take two years or more than three years or four years. But I think that is the responsibility of the current government. This, that is the responsibility of the or our government, I think. Mm. That, that is such an important point. Um, I certainly, uh, we have encountered uh, clients and, and companies who consider really outer space as open access, wild west to where anything goes, if you can get there. But you're right that there is a, a big educational component. I think that that is, is important in these issues. So let me pivot to something that Franz, you introduced, which is the importance of national legislation. So we have the international rulemaking, we have the national legislation. 
Sasha, if I could um, turn to you uh, to speak to the evolution of national legislation. Are there examples that spring to mind where countries, in your view, are doing it right in terms of filling the gaps, providing needed guidance? And are there limitations, in your view, of what national legislation can accomplish in filling these gaps? Yes, I, I think there are certainly limitations. And of course, part of the problem is when it, for example, comes to something like mitigating space debris, which everyone recognizes is a big issue now, um, you don't want to go too far ahead of the rest. It's the same thing with general environmental legislation. If you are going to impose on your national operator certain additional burdens for the sake of uh, mitigating space debris, you don't want others to not be confronted with the same rules because then you basically disadvantage your own industry. So that's always the kind of uh, free rider, free rider kind of argument. Um, at the same time, there's so much that national space law can do to uphold the international treaties uh, because it's the states which have the actual authority in many ways, legally and otherwise, to, to make it work as well. If you ask for a, for a perfect space law, uh, it depends a little bit on what you want. Um, let me at least say that the United States is in one perspective not the perfect example, and that has to do with the fact that they were maybe a trifle too pragmatic. And what do I mean with that? They took sector by sector. Once there was the potential for private involvement in the sector, they picked up that sector and started to, um, to uh, address it by way of national regulation. So when in the early 1970s, it became clear that satellite communication was a potentially commercial business, uh, the FCC, which was the regulatory authority for, satellite for telecommunications in the US, was made to also regulate satellite communications. And then a decade and a half later, there were potential. Uh, there was the potential for commercial launch services and for commercial Earth observation services. Although the first market worked out more or less, and the second did not for a number of reasons. So they created two separate new sets of acts with again diverging agencies, and it means that each time there is a new private sector type of activity on on the uh, appearing on the board, you do, do not even have the principled. Uh, framework to say, okay, this is the regulatory agency. Uh, there is, for example, take space mining, which is a hot issue since a number of years. There is still discussion which agency, would it be the FAA, which regulates the, the, the license, launch licensing, or the FCC, which regulates the frequencies, or would it be uh, NOAA, which regulates space remote sensing, or yet another new or existing entity. So that creates a lot of fragmentation. So uh, I'm not going to say who my favorite is, but the U.S. is perhaps not my favorite, at least from an abstract academic perspective. I mean, I can see where it comes from, and so far it does work uh, relatively well, I should say, but it's not the it's not the ideal logically coherent system. Well, that was very diplomatically put. <laughs> I'd expect no less. <laughs> um, Sasha, over to you for, for your perspective, obviously from the private sector uh, perspective on the same question. I actually, I agree in a lot of ways uh, with what was just said, because honestly, there is a lot of fragmentation. It's not just the U.S. We find this in other countries. As you develop space oversight, there is a lot of complexity that they, they don't realize until they've developed it. So we see this right now in odd, unexpected places for many. We're struggling on the rocket side and the insurance side. Turns out, strangely enough, you cannot go to space without a rocket yet. So who's hand and rockets are very nationally focused, but satellites in space are not. So the complexities there are things that, that trip up a lot of emerging companies. And the other one is insurance based on liability. A lot of countries quite understandably develop insurance uh, structures or guidelines, but the various countries don't always match with the launching country obligation. So we see last minute crises with the ability to launch if one national legislation doesn't connect with another. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would I would say that uh, as a former US regulator, I, I, I have a certain fondness, but I do agree that there are a lot of, of um, fragmentation issues and uh, and we stumble over them a lot on the private side. 
does that mean, Sasha, that there's, um, shall we call it foreign shopping that goes on on the private sector side or launch pad shopping? Uh, is, is that something that a dynamic that you see where there's some jurisdictions that are seen as a little bit more coherent for purposes of launch uh, versus uh, actual outer space activities? Well, actually, there's definitely forum shopping. I see that a lot in the satellite industry for the satellite side. The launch side, because it's so nationalistic in very important ways, I, I, I understand why, but the issue becomes who can you launch on if you are a satellite of an X nation? And how does that limit your opportunities to get to space when you need to uh, for something we haven't discussed yet? And it's something that's very near and dear to the private sector, and that's yeah. funding, financing. Your finance doesn't wait while the international government, world of governments, or even nationals spend a few years developing laws. Your financing says, uh, we're here to give you this much money to give you a year or two years to get something up, and then we'll see about more financing. And uh, that those two mix very slowly. So if you are a satellite of one country and you want to launch on another and you have limitations because they won't talk to your country or you can't provide the export availability, this really gets in the way of access to space. So Sasha, if I could stick with you for a moment about a, a very sticky issue, and that's spectrum. <laughs> when it comes oh, to oh yes. There we go. Um, and people may not know this, but it's the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, that actually promulgates the guidelines for allocating frequency use by satellites. So one of the oldest um, international organizations is, is playing very much in this field. Now, obviously, when we had um, satellites that were larger and stayed in stationary orbit, that was simpler. Now with this proliferation where you have an advent of constellations and mega constellations of dozens of thousands, you know, to thousands of satellites operating at multiple often changing orbits, that's a completely different enterprise. Um, what can you share with us about the challenges uh, that ha are currently uh, in existence around the spectrum allocation issues? and whether ITU's rulemaking is sufficient to meet those challenges. I, well, to be fair to the ITU and the people who work so hard uh, all year round from all the countries, it is really an extraordinary effort. Um, it is impossible, almost impossible to imagine how you could effectively get out ahead of the mega constellations on the regulatory side. They are, um, although, although there had been earlier attempts at constellations, they were not of nearly of this size. And the impact on the regulatory structure is sort of unheard of. Because, and here's why, on the ITU front, as you said, when, when a satellite is in a relatively stable position over the years, it is easier to assess what it sees, when it sees it, uh, what countries are implicated, what it's near, what other countries are implicated, their satellites. And that allows a lot of um, ability for the parties and the countries to manage. Dynamic movement of, of international satellite mega constellations throws that all in disarray. LEOs are not new. LEOs have been here since the beginning of the satellite environment but they weren't necessarily private sector and they weren't necessarily run through these frequency uh, dynamics. So how the ITU handles that and how the private sector can work with national groups to manage that is, I think, one of the greatest challenges. It, it, it is um, complicated, I'd like to point out, by the other needs for spectrum. We spent years at the ITU addressing the dynamic, and they still are, of terrestrial needs for spectrum versus satellite needs for spectrum. Again, complicated by small satellites who use frequencies at different timings and for different periods of time. Shorter maybe, they're up there for less time, the constellation overall is. Those sorts of things really, really add complexity to which frequencies can you use, how do you use it, how do you share with your terrestrial neighbors, and as we all know, Terrestrial is a very critical element. It can't live without 
the satellites for a lot of backhaul and other important communications and, and geopositioning. But you uh, also, you, you can't impact the terrestrial too much. We're all far too dependent as a global society and increasingly so on that. So I, I don't know if that, if that got as far as you want. It's hard not to want to just dive into the, no, to no, the no, issue. No. But. <laughs> Whole symposium in and of itself, given the context, right. that is, that's a perfect kind of setup to just identify it as you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about spectrum at least a little bit in a panel that talks about challenges. Um, let me circle back to one other form of guideline or rule generation that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Uh, and, and this is for, for anyone who wants to chime in, but it's, it's this particular instance of private public sector collaboration. And I'm referring to uh, the, the recent, uh, it's back in March, 2021, where NASA and SpaceX announced an agreement, the Space Act Agreement, under which SpaceX agreed to maneuver any of its Starlink satellites to safer orbits if they're expected to make an unusually close approach with a NASA craft or the international space system. Um, I mentioned station, excuse me. I mention it because it's just kind of a remarkable example of an agreement uh, that seeks to regulate particular conduct uh, related to, to satellites. Should we expect to see more of these types of agreements? Are they a useful tool, even if obviously um, binding only on the parties who've signed? But um, this is really for anyone who wants to take it up. What do you think about this as a means of norm generation? If, if I may kick that one off, uh... I think we will see it uh, more and more often for obvious reasons. Uh, it's quick. It just concerns two parties, uh, and it and it sort of helps alleviate a particular problem, which at that point in time needs to be solved or a risk or a threat. But for exactly the same reasons, I would hope that uh, it's not going to be the only way of regulating that. Because if we talk about fragmentation, there you have it. Um, and it's uh, if, if NASA has good relations with SpaceX for a number of reasons, part of which no doubt is the fact that SpaceX has big contracts with running with NASA and they want to keep uh, renewing them. Um, if the European Space Agency, for example, would have the same problem, they might get totally ignored or the, the, the issue might up with, uh, you know, the might, up, uh, might result in a totally different case. And there has been recently with um, uh, a case where uh, the European Space Agency was worried that one of its satellites was potentially threatened by a, uh, uh, I believe it was a SpaceX satellite, which was under certain predictions potentially coming to close because it was leaving its orbit or out of its nominal orbit. And then they asked the, oper the private operator to, to, to readjust, to use some of its fuel to uh, remaneuver back to a better position. Uh, and uh, the private operator said, well, we don't see the risk that seriously, uh, so we're not going to waste precious fuel on that, which meant that the European Space Agency, in its fear that still something bad might happen, then had to maneuver its satellite out of the way. So if all of these kind of potential conjunctions uh, uh, are going to be uh, regulated on an individual basis, I'm afraid sooner or later things will go really you know, it will go really wrong. And that, of course, brings us to the uh, subject of space traffic management. I don't want, don't know whether you want to put it on the table right now, but uh, we can reserve it for later, too. Well, that, that's also another another treatise in the making. Um, why don't why don't we, we uh, pivot a bit because um, in the remaining time before we open it for questions to space debris, just because this is such an important issue, obviously, obviously dovetails with environmental concerns, but environment in the out, in outer space. Um, it now, space debris, uh, as currently reported by NASA, comprises 90%, 90% of the objects tracked in orbit. So obviously really important, can have catastrophic consequences. Uh, in September, Major General Deanna Burt, Vice Commander of Space Forces Space Operations Command, highlighted this issue in particular call for commercial op options for active debris removal, especially for objects in low Earth orbit. Franz, let me just start with you. We've talked a little bit about risks already, but what, from the perspective of different uh, players in particular, what are the key risks associated with space debris 
for environment, for space? How do you how do you view this topic in terms of importance? I, I have to partly defer to the scientists on this because uh, you have some who are very alarmist and say if we don't do anything within five years, nobody can do anything safely in outer space anymore. And if you go to the internet, you have these beautiful graphics which show a big belt of junk, impenetrable belt of junk. Uh, mm -hmm in certain orbits now of course that's partly due to the fact that these dots are grossly uh, unproportional they they are a thousand times or, or a million times as big as the real thing in proportion at the same time the speed with which all this flies can cause even a small paint chip to kill an astronaut if it happens to pierce a suit at the wrong at the wrong moment so i i, I don't want to downplay the risk mm -hmm. it is unclear to what extent uh, we are already in, if in, in are already too late, whether, whether it's five before 12 or five minutes after 12. Uh, mm -hmm. but it is clear that everyone is increasingly getting, uh, aware of the risk. And the good thing, if you allow me, is that we are all in this boat together. So the more you have at stake in space, uh, whether you're in the United States or China or Russia or India, the more you are interested in somehow trying to solve this problem. So you see increasingly, it's not exactly an answer to your question, but you see increasingly also these players trying to think about not only technologies, which could do something about taking out dead satellites or, or, or sweeping up particles in, in, in low Earth orbit to take the space to be out of the, out of the equation, at least to some extent, but also how do you legally properly regulated because just to give two legal problems that would currently arise if you talk about liability if some state goes up and cleans something and then something goes wrong that state which is presumably doing that for the common good of all eh, cleaning up the mess then is still liable if another state satellite uh, is, is, is hurt. So there's nothing like a good Samaritan principle which would sort of alleviate the liability. And in terms of the registration, now I'm speaking about the bigger satellites, uh, there might be a willingness of a certain state to take a, a big satellite out of orbit. Uh, but if it belongs to another satellite, uh, another state, that other state may say, wait a minute, I have some very sensitive military technology on board of the satellite, and I don't want you to grapple that. And I perhaps don't even want you to develop the technology to grapple it, because next time you may actually grapple my satellite. So. It is, it is an interesting development, but the, a lot needs to be done there. Mm -hmm. Well, let me turn to you, um, Dr. Zemin. I, I, I'm gonna ask you a question. I think I know what your answer is, but I'll ask it this way anyway. Uh, should private aerospace industry be left alone by governments and IOs to self-regulate around um, debris removal? Or do you think this is a place of appropriate national legislation? Mm -hmm. Yes, we sh we should. Uh, out this out of space is a truly a global command, and it is also limited in nature. And space uh, space activities, including a small thought whether by government agencies or private uh, actors, should be governed by international law. That is a basic principle. Uh, this is why it is not appropriate for the for the private aerospace industry to self-regulate with respect to space debris removal in particular. The private industries should respect not only international, but also national regulations. So in that connection, so, uh, let me take um, a case, collaboration between uh, public sector and the private sector in formulating national regulations in in my country. I said, uh, I already mentioned several times that is uh, recommendations on development and operations of spacecraft for space debris mitigations. Uh, these recommendations uh, were adopted in July 20, last year. By the, by the working committee of the National Space Committee under the control of the, the president of the Republic of Korea. So even though the, the legal nature of these recommendations is non-legally binding, voluntary, and also recommendatory, but it took about 10 years. That is, there was a hard job because I dropped it 
the provisions of digital recommendations. Uh, digital recommendation applied will apply to industries and universities and public or private institutions in in Korea. And also digital recommendation applied to development and operation of newly designed spacecraft since this adoption. So we, we, so we started to discuss if the Republic of Korea will apply UN Corpus Space Debris Mitigation Guideline to national development and the operation of spacecraft with the, the discussion of International Code of Conduct for Outer Space active, Activities. At that time, the, the problem to mitigate space debris is one of the most important things in the, in the process of negotiation of the draft Code of Conduct. And this is why we start this, uh, we start to discuss that I, I, I want to say briefly the this discussion stage because it is quite, imp quite important to persuade uh, the stakeholders. So we, uh, we, I, I start to discuss these guidelines you know, maybe in, in, in 2011. And I, so we gathered, we, we all we gathered the industries and the professors from the Korean universities and institutions, but they opposed to the adoption of this kind of recommendation because they, they thought that at the time, this kind of recommendation will be obstacle to develop technology because we are not we are not advanced uh, nations for our space activity, just we are emerging countries and we are emerging universities and emerging uh, uh, institute. And it, this is why the discussion almost stopped for, mm -hmm. for about four years. And we restart the discussion in, 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 in 2017, and we, 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 dis, we continue to discuss uh, uh, for, for two years on this uh, problem. But uh, suddenly the discussion stopped. Why discussion stopped? Because uh, pro some uh, professor uh, came to the government and to say that we don't need this kind of recommendation. And also those recommendations will be big hurdles to develop our technology. This is not good, good way to continue. As it's quite hard. It's very, it, 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 it was a very hard job, but I also, I also, I, I continue I made an effort to persuade the current government and the officer that that worked for the the government because in the near future the problem of space debris will be a diplomatic problem and also so you know you have to know that the several uh, advanced superpower space faring nations know already that uh, the current space program do not meet the international standard with respect to mitigation of space debris. Uh, this is why, so why now we need to, we have to uh, meet international standard and it's applied to national space uh, development program. And, but, uh, Unhappiness discussions almost stopped, almost stopped. But we have a good up, but uh, we had a good opportunity. That is the the the, the UN Corpus guidelines for the long term sustainability of outer space activities. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the 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 current government think that we at at the present stage the current government. Uh, we have to contribute to international community, also in the area of space activities. Mm 
that is that is these guidelines for the contribution to international community. This is how we, we restart. And finally, so last year, so we, we adopted this, uh, this uh, recommendation. But also, but even though the some, some, some professor and the some and the engineer with high level I go to the government, it, 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 is, it is not easy to, to follow, to meet the national guideline. Mm -hmm. And also we know that the this guideline is not uh, legally binding, it's a, that they are the uh, voluntary and the recommendatory. And this is why so we, uh, so we, we will continue to do so with um, our own way. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a big uh, problem, yes. Thank you. And, and I think that um, the, the, these guidelines on long-term sustainability of space activities is going to be very much yeah. discussed when it comes to things like space debris. So before we move, we have um, just, a, just a couple of minutes, but before we move to the audience questions, um, I would ask you all to take out your crystal balls and take a look and in a minute or less, <laughs> this is for each of you, <laughs> I've, tried, I've thrown down a challenge. What do you think is the biggest challenge presented by the proliferation of small sets and what's the most promising avenue to solve it? In a minute and a half, go. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I promise you, you won't be held to it. And I know it's just, um, you can point to just one, one aspect of the, of the challenge, if you like. Who wants to go first? Okay, well, let me, let me go first again. Um, uh, I think ultimately the, the, the most challenging issue is, is space traffic management because that includes space sustainability, it includes space debris, but it also includes safety of, of human spaceflight issues uh, and things like that. So it's, it's kind of the uh, everything comes together kind of thing. Um, and the way it needs to be solved is ultimately internationally, but at the same time, it will start with incremental bottom-up developments already you see in the United States right now. And you give me a sign when my minute and a half is up, right? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you already see in the United States initial developments. Uh, so far, the human spaceflight issue is, of course, the, the, the one most directly interested because the human lives at stake. And that takes almost all of that takes place from the United States, with the exception of some Russian and Chinese flights. Um, but those are not private flights to start with. So you do see a, a initial efforts, and there was actually a space, uh, a presidential directive of the previous administration, which already put space traffic management as a very important issue on the agenda of the US. But ultimately, it, I'm convinced, and that's not just because I'm European, but I'm convinced that it should be internationally arranged to some level. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Dr. John, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, the biggest challenges with the, the proliferation of small SAT is the, the difficulty it adds to the problem of detection. Uh, satellites are becoming essential for, in particular, conventional military operations in ensuring very coordinated tactical operations and for, for, other, uh, for other uses. Uh, given the scale of requirement by, um, by the militaries around the world, the trend toward the small satellite is unlikely to end. In the end, for, for in order to resolve, resolve this uh, biggest challenge, we need to uh, we, we need to have uh, capacity, for example, so space situational awareness. It, the, 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 U, the U.S. government also know that the, their say, capacity, their capacity to first uh, space situational awareness is not sufficient to, to detect or space object and or a space debris in orbit. Uh, 
uh, this is why say, in this condition we need uh, say we need uh, it is quite difficult to cooperate at the international at the international level. I uh, just uh, I I I let me uh, so let me point and if in the for example say, say over this over the Korean Peninsula, uh, there is no say, there is no uh, facilities to there's I think there's any facilities for SSA, mm -hmm. but. International community already start to talk about a uh, space traffic management, and also U.S. Air Force uh, start to speak about uh, space domain awareness, not the uh, space situational awareness. Uh, this is why I think the with the, the biggest challenge is the population of cetera, We have to we have to have uh, capacity capacity and we have to build a capacity to detect uh, space debris mm -hmm. uh, and also space object uh, with international cooperation, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Slash it over to you. I, I'd love to tie those two together because I agree firmly with them. And to me, what you really need to do is you need to have space, you need to have the state sponsor uh, the ecosystem of technology. And I don't mean do the technology, I mean sponsor the creativity in the private sector to develop the ecosystem around simply how to get it up there and what's up there. As we've said, how do you get it down? The space situational awareness is a very serious one. How do you know what's up there? How do you address it? How do you move it? There is so much that goes around beyond that. And it is lagging behind in the technology. And if governments come in and encourage it or provide, you know, subsidize some of it or something like that, it gets the boost to help address these bigger issues. Thank you. All right, let's um, open it up to, to some of the, the Q&A. Um, uh, Franz, you've been a wonderful professor and that you've gone through and answered a lot of them, which is great. Oh, I'm um, sorry, I didn't no, wanna. Oh, that's very, very good. There's a few that I wanted to circle back to so we can get um, a discussion going. One is from Chris who asks, uh, right now about 58% of active satellites in orbit are under US jurisdiction. Would requiring EIA, so that's environmental impact assessments, in orbit under US law, as Viasat is asking the DC courts, be a positive or negative development? Um, Franz, why don't you just reiterate uh, what your answer was, and then I'll ask others um, for where they stand on that issue. Okay, sure. Um, I, I would be tempted to view this generally as a positive development. It fits in the law, in the current status of international space law, also to the extent that, of course, if it's U.S. satellites and if they're U.S. registered, the U.S. is the state who is to exercise quasi-territorial jurisdiction over the satellites, which for example, may include also applying patent law to whatever inventions are included on the satellite and things like that, so just to give another example. So it, it makes perfect sense. And I think it's a good it's a good way to start. Someone has to take the lead, again, in the absence of the likelihood that we will soon see a, a, an international treaty massively agreed to. It will work bottom up. And if the leading states, the ones who really do stuff there, then come up with a solution and then hopefully other states uh, next five states, so to speak, will basically be in the same ballpark, then we may start to see some coherence or convergence, maybe some customary international law arranging. So as long as it doesn't disrupt the process of, of as, it, as, as long as it doesn't go too far outside the current framework of international law, I think that's basically a positive devel de de development, sorry. <laughs> Understood. Anyone else on this question or EIAs in space? I think it's a fair question. I think the, the realistic question is, do we know enough of the science to address what the environmental impact is, which is in fact what Professor Von Dunk said earlier. And, and is, is, is it, who, whose science are we assessing uh, based on? So if we can come to a common awareness of that, then I think it's a wonderful development. Shouldn't should be done early on and as part of a process. Understood. 
Dr. Jung, any further thoughts on this? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so no, I, 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 I don't have to anything to say. <laughs> okay, understood. Um, there's a, an additional and related point, which is thinking about reparations and compensation and the context of outer space. Uh, Chris asked the follow-up question about the thinking about such um, compensation for environmental harm, either from the sense of cost of impairing the resource orbit or cost of repair. For contaminating an orbit with debris, one seems fairly cheap, but two seems massively expensive. How should this calculus be adapted in space? So reparations for environmental harm in space. Any thoughts on that one? Franz, do you want to start with um, just reiterating your thought on that? If, if you prod me, I can't resist, <laughs> of course. Um, I think that's also a great issue. Uh, and it, I think it's difficult to uh, to answer that. I mean, it also goes back to what, what uh, Dr. Field says that you know you it's you first need to know the science and be on the same page to establish that. Uh, my thought is that part of the deal might also be the insurance sector because they are very good at at they make their living out of risk calculation and risk uh, uh, pricing. Uh, statistical analysis, uh, because that's how they presumably make their profit or their business profitable. And I might, I'm not an insurance expert, I should say, but there might well be tools which help the private, the, the public sector to give an idea of, uh, of the costs of making sure that whatever is there is not going to hit something else. Um, mm -hmm. But this was just a thought off the top of my head, and I could well imagine that there are much better ideas. I, I think it's it's got to be a major issue, absolutely. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I love the idea of the insurance sector getting involved. <laughs> Actually, it, it, in, in that it is an assessment of risk sharing. Yeah. And uh, and and if you don't in in imperfect information. So with imperfect information, how do we assess what the risk is and how do we allocate it? And it allows for both the public sector to get some protection and the private sector to have some, I mean, it's hard, no one wants to spend more money on a very expensive project, but if you know upfront what the insurance cost is, you can work it into what, whether you can raise the funds you need or how, many, how much funds you need. And, and that goes back to whether the government can help in that. I would also say whoops, that, uh, oh, the CLA, that's very important for a lot of people. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you can that keep going. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That, that would, you know, for those of us who've had to deal with that over the years, please make sure that's up there front and center. <laughs> I, anyway, I, I think part of the problem, of course, with insurance is that uh, it needs, as I was saying before, it needs, it's an industry that needs a lot of support in technology and engagement and understanding as well. Yeah, and I will say that um, we had seen in, in our practice a significant uptick in insurance products specifically directed at outer space activities in the last five years. And the other place that we've seen a lot of activities in the private equity sector, which is obviously also expert at calculating risk. Um, and those are certainly um, very interesting um, uh, points when it comes to thinking about assessing risk and compensation, et cetera, um, but, but very good points indeed. So I had just one last question, and um, that is one of the joys of the International Law Week is that we get so many students uh, that come to these programs and benefit from, from these programs. And we have a question uh, from one of our audience members, Devin, who is fascinated by international space law and is asking for a, a sense of how to get into this field. So for the, the, this wonderful next generation that's going to be grappling with these issues and continuing to take them forward, any advice? Well, it, I, I'm sorry, I'm tempted to again take the floor as the first. So <laughs> please tell me if that's not okay. I'm, I'm happy to stand back. But as a professor, no, obviously, this is right up my alley, right? Uh, well, there's fortunately there's a lot of uh, relatively uh, easy entrance ways. Uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm a member of the International Institute of Space Law, where a couple of young geniuses have come up with what they call the knowledge constellation, which is a very, which is a set of very easy, or often just one page or one graphic introduction into legal issues, and then from there on, you can of course go as deep as you want. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there in in digital commons articles on all sorts of uh, on, on all sorts of uh, specific and topic legal issues um and the number of and we talked about it privately before we opened up to to the audience uh the number of of universities also in the united states but also elsewhere who now have students interested in space law as part of public international law who create space law societies space law student societies even though they don't have a formal space law program yet um is is booming uh, so there should be uh, regardless of where you are basically there should be not too far away some university where at least the students already are getting together and getting enthusiastic about these things and uh, of course i'm happy to you know uh, on any private level you can write me an email and i can inform you about the various programs and possibilities that we have at the university of nebraska but obviously there are many other opportunities both in the us as well as outside so i don't want to sort of monopolize here the uh the educational uh, perspective <laughs> not at all any other any other um thoughts for students i would say well first i have put in a little plug for the space law mood court because i think yeah. it's an excellent opportunity for students to challenge themselves not only in the legal field mood court is fun but in thinking about the different pieces of the laws that are involved and then the other thing i would say absolutely besides please do as many internships as you can anywhere you can uh, is remember to take a broad array of courses because as we've discussed space law it's international it's national it's about technology law you should know about patent you should know about insurance you should know about financing i mean the more you know about how those pieces at least some familiarity about how those impact space and the space faring issues, the better you will be as a, as a professional. And we desperately need more professionals. It's such a booming area. We need more bodies. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, well, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you audience members uh, for those wonderful questions. Really appreciate it. And again, thank you for sharing your Saturday morning for, with us. Um, it's been a marvelous discussion. So take care. Be safe. Goodbye, everyone. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.